Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great to see everybody this morning. Um, we uh, have with us Dr. Michael Burgess, who's going to talk about what's happening today with respect to the uh, hearing going on in the Rules Committee um, on Medicare for All. Uh, we also wanted to just begin with um, thoughts and prayers and condolences about the terrible shooting that happened over the weekend at the synagogue in California. Um, and uh, just remind everybody how crucially important it is for all of us to speak out and stand against anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence. Um, and, and we should not be faced with the kind of rise in anti-Semitic events we're seeing across the country today. And we um, in the House Republicans will continue uh, to stand against that to make sure we call evil by its name. Uh, we also this morning in conference had a really moving and important presentation uh, by a young man named Enrique Pedron, who escaped from Cuba in 1994. He made the very brave decision to leave Cuba to come to the United States. He's written about this, uh, and he talked uh, about his firsthand experience living in a country uh, that is a socialist nation and what it means and why he had to escape and the price that he personally paid for so-called free health care, free education, um, and, and the extent to which uh, he shared... Uh, a small house, his bathroom was a hole in the ground that they had to share with six other families. And not only did they not have the money that they needed to be able to make the kinds of repairs uh, on the home, um, but even if they had had resources, they couldn't get permission from the local political commissar to purchase the materials that they needed. And he uh, wants very much, he published an op-ed talking about his experiences so that people in this country who are advocating socialism will understand and recognize um, the human cost and the absolute loss of freedom. It, it also is a tremendous reminder about the price people have been willing to pay for freedom and, and people who have braved the shark-infested waters between Cuba and the United States as an example, and as Enrique did, uh, to come here to seek a better life. And, and we will continue to, to fight against the kinds of socialist policies we're seeing and, and continue to stand against that. Um, and with that, I would like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Michael Burgess uh, from the uh, Rules Committee uh, to talk about the uh, Democrats' health care bill. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheney. Uh, Rules Committee is meeting even as we speak right now to consider a bill that would uh, actually be a single-payer, government-run, top-down, Soviet-style, command-and-control health care bill. At least that's how I'm characterizing it. Uh, look, I spent nearly 30 years practicing medicine in North Texas. One of the reasons I ran for Congress was I thought it was important to keep the patient at the center of our health care discussions, and I was concerned even several years ago about the encroachment of the United States government into the treatment rooms where uh, I was trying to take care of patients. Every time you turned around, there was some new rule or, or requirement from Medicare, uh, some reimbursement decision that was being made by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So this takeover that we're going to be discussing up in the Rules Committee this morning will have irreversible ramifications for the doctor-patient relationship. Look, I am the son of a physician. I am the grandson of a physician. My grandfather worked as an academic OB-GYN in Montreal. He was at McGill University. My dad was thought would follow in his footsteps, but he made the decision that what he saw going on with healthcare policy in Canada was not to his choosing. He was fortunate enough to get a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic and moved to the United States and never looked back. I do not want to see us do the same things, the same mistakes that were made uh, in our neighbor to the north. Look, one size fits all is really no size, one size fits no one. And here's the deal. The Congressional Budget Office puts out their figures the same day the Mueller report comes out, and 2.6 million people have health insurance through their employer that didn't have it when Donald Trump took office. That's actually a pretty good story to tell. Uh, in a large group market, the ERISA regulated market, no exclusion for pre-existing conditions. When I was a physician, if someone came in with a group Aetna, a group Cigna health plan, uh, you're pretty pretty good insurance, then you're likely to get reimbursed. So that was a patient that uh, that I'm willing to see, willing to open my doors for. We're going to take all that away with this bill that we're considering up in the Rules Committee today. So rather than taking away things from people, 
I would think the Democrats would be trying to figure out how we can get people more for what we're already spending. But they chose not to do that. So large group market, ERISA plans, gone. Federal employment health benefit plan, gone. TRICARE, gone. I mean, these are the things that they are talking about. I encourage people who haven't read the bill to read the bill. It's not terribly long, about 127 pages. Uh, but it is pretty tough reading. In fact, I had to go back and reread it on Sunday because I couldn't be sure that I remembered it accurately from a few weeks before. I couldn't sleep Sunday night. Reading the stuff in that bill is truly frightening when you think of, first off, from someone trying to provide health care, but honestly, for someone receiving health care and someone counting on the fact that, hey, now the government's going to take over, I won't have to worry about anything. Now that the government's taking over, you've got to worry about everything. But uh, thank the chairwoman for letting me be part of this. I'll be up in the Rules Committee for the next 12 hours if anyone needs me. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck up there, Doc. Uh, there will be a doctor in the house. Um, uh, like Liz, I share a deep concern about the rise in anti-Semitism that we're seeing around the country. And of course, our prayers are with everyone at the, at the synagogue in California, uh, the, the fatality as well as the injured. Um, you know, we commend those heroes, the rabbi, uh, the off-duty border patrol agent to uh, help confront the shooter and run the shooter off and ultimately led to uh, the, uh, the capture. Uh, we also are concerned about what we're seeing on this far left socialist agenda from Nancy Pelosi. And just a short period of time, we've seen some of the most radical ideas. And unfortunately, the ideas keep getting worse. Uh, and especially what we're talking about today and what, what Dr. Burgess will be spending a good quality time in the Rules Committee discussing. Uh, but it's a serious issue, uh, and it exposes where the Democrats really want to go on health care. It started with the Affordable Care Act, which clearly was not affordable. And the lies, the broken promises, uh, if you like what you have, you can keep it. Uh, costs were going to be lower, and in fact, now costs are even higher. Uh, many millions of Americans, including people with pre-existing conditions, are not only seeing double-digit increases in their premiums, they're seeing deductibles as high as $10,000. That's not affordable health care. That's not the direction we want to go. And in fact, now they want to go even further to the left with this idea that it's not about Medicare for all. Uh, it's about taking away private insurance. Uh, under the Democrat bill, over 150 million Americans would lose the good health care that they have in the private insurance market. Uh, again, another broken promise. If you like what you have, you can keep it, not under this health care bill, uh, where they literally would take away more and more choices in a, over 150 million people losing good health care they like. It would destroy rural hospitals uh, all across America and would lead to fewer choices and higher costs. We want to protect people with pre-existing conditions while focus on lowering premiums, giving families more choices. Let families choose which doctor they want to see and which plan they want to buy for their family, not some unelected bureaucrat in Washington. So it's a very clear contrast of where the Democrats are trying to take us further down a path uh, that destroys good health care for 100, over 100 million Americans versus what we want to do to help protect families with pre-existing conditions and families without pre-existing conditions who are paying too much and have fewer choices. Let's give them more choices with lower premiums. And finally, we're going to see tomorrow uh, the, uh, the Democrats trying to push us back into the Paris Accord. Uh, President Trump rightfully removed us from that agreement. By, by the way, every country that's in the agreement isn't even achieving the goals that they set out. Uh, if you look at what it's going to do, it would wreck every manufacturing economy involved. The American manufacturing economy, by the way, we're seeing this incredible renaissance. We're seeing an energy dominant renaissance, but we're seeing a job renaissance because millions of jobs are coming back to America. Higher wages are the result for families that are hardworking, uh, that we're looking for better opportunities. They're finally seeing those opportunities and that would go away. And where would it go? Those jobs would go to China. They would go to India, countries that are exempt from the very Paris Accord numbers that everybody's talking about till 2030. And by the way, they're the, high, they're the highest emitters. Uh, in America, we've actually seen a reduction since 2000 in carbon emissions, a dramatic reduction uh, through technology. Uh, so we don't want to lose the great economic gains we've achieved, and we don't want to lose the reduction in carbon emissions that we've been able to achieve over the last 19 years because of not just economic growth, but because of great innovation in technology 
that America has always been known for. Let's not yield those kind of gains to countries like China and India, who emit five times, in many cases, more carbon than we do. So we'll be battling on all of those fronts. Now, our leader, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you. I do want to associate myself with the comments earlier about um, our thoughts and prayers for those in the synagogue. To the rabbi, to the individual who sacrificed her own life um, to protect the rabbi, there's no greater love. But this rise in anti-Semitism is something that we have seen not just in America but across the world. We do not want history to repeat itself. That's why times inside this conference we have taken action, action on this floor. It's concerning to me that the rise in anti-Semitism isn't just across the nation, but at times we've heard it from individuals inside this own Congress. That has got to stop. We should speak with one voice. You should not have to water down a resolution because you do not want to offend a member on the questioning of an individual's loyalty based upon their own faith to a nation. I want to thank Congressman Burgess, not only for his service in the health field, but his father and his grandfather. There's no issue he is, that he is not more passionate about than health care. He's passionate about because he believes everybody should have the ability to be able to have health care. But he's watched what the Democrats, and this is not something that people sit back and say, oh, it's just one or two of their ideas. More than half their conference has co-sponsored this bill, a co-sponsoring of the bill. A hearing is taking place in the Rules Committee. It will guarantee more than 150 million Americans will lose their health care. And this is something that they continue to move forward. Not just throw out an idea to talk about, they are now having a hearing in more than half of their conference co-sponsoring the bill. To guarantee if you have private health insurance today, you can no longer have it. TRICARE can no longer survive. This is their answer. It is more control, it is more socialism, instead of the freedom that Dr. Burgess has watched the practice of health care and the innovation continue to grow. From that same idea, if we watch what's going to happen on the floor this week, it's the exact same thing we talked about three weeks ago when they hit the 100 days of the Democrat majority. Not much action. No budget. Where Speaker Pelosi has said time and time again, show me your budget, show me your values. How can you plan to move any pieces of legislation if you do not have a budget? Why did you become a majority if you cannot produce a budget? Then when they tried to produce just a few caps, they could not even move it onto the floor. They had to pull it back. The only thing they could move are resolutions. Now they want to move this week to talk about the Paris Accord. Not a treaty. Didn't go before the Senate. But what we really should be talking about, what America is doing to lower their emissions. At the same time in 2017, the millions of tons of emissions that we have reduced, we've done it through technology. We've done it through innovation. And at the same time when we watch this, this week, the economic growth that America has had, becoming energy independent in a safer model for the rest of the world, but also making our emissions even lower. But China and India continue to expand. It's interesting to watch if you study the policies of the Democrats, they want to release the power to other nations and make the world actually not cleaner because America's innovation is making the world cleaner and safer at the same time. That we can have a win-win. I know today they'll sit and meet with the president. What's interesting, the common denominator, no matter what the subject the Democrats bring up, is a tax increase. Be it from election reform, they want to take more taxes from hardworking taxpayers. Be it infrastructure, they'll only agree to something unless they're able to raise taxes. It's very clear with their plan. No budget for the future, and just to be able to take more money from hardworking taxpayers across America. So let me stop there and take a few questions. Yes, sir. On, on the gas. Have you spoken, because of your position in the opposition, have you
you spoken to the president about uh, the gas tax or your feelings about the gas tax going into this meeting with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer today? I talked to the president. I just talked to him last night. But the Democrats aren't talking about a gasoline tax. They're talking about more than just that. Not just a gasoline tax, but they're talking about changing the tax code, making sure that people pay more. Um, we're watching GDP growth when people thought it would be zero, above 3%. We're watching unemployment claims at a lower rate that it's been than 50 years. We're watching more people work and more jobs being offered than actually people looking for them. But they want to change the tax system. And if you watch what they said today before they walk in, you have to raise taxes on the American public. Not a rationale why, but that's just what they believe. Be it election reform, if they raise $200, they think taxpayers should give them $1,200. This is the common denominator with the Democrats. So based on that conversation with the president, I don't think, I don't think do their think meeting will go very well. Um, no matter what you do on infrastructure, you have to have a bipartisan it seems to me that the Democrats, knowing that they haven't been able to accomplish anything within 100 days, name me one solution to a problem that they have solved. Name me one that they have done within 100 days. And they're walking into a meeting today saying you have to change the tax cuts to the American public and raise taxes on the American public if they were to go along with an infrastructure bill. Believe, I think that's a loss. Do you believe the president is still supportive of the gas tax? That's a question for the president. Yes. Do you think Attorney General Lynn Bell should testify under the parameters outlined by the Utah Commission? Well, I think the Attorney General has done a terrific job. I think the Attorney General wants to come and speak to members of Congress, and I think that's his priority. It's interesting to me that the Democrat majority now would try to change course, that they are more concerned about attorneys talking to the Attorney General than members themselves. I think the priority, priority should be members asking the questions. Yeah, they can. I just think a priority should be the members themselves, and I think that's the prior priority of uh, Attorney General Barr. Yes, ma'am. I think it comes to the same conclusion. Um, there was no obstruction and there was no collusion. Um, so I'm very confident and um, think we a country should move forward. We've got a lot of challenges out there. And I think that's the things that we should be focused on. I know the Democrats continue to want to search for something that's not there. I think after all this time, after all the interviews, after the millions of dollars are spent, I think it's best for America to move forward. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right, Doc. We've rescued you for a little while.